My name is Amata, and in this Red Gamer Tech video, I am here with the latest from the tech and gaming world in the last 24 or so hours. So what do I have for you today? Well, we're going to kick things off with a visit to NVIDIA and Intel and their licensing deal, as an interesting report has surfaced. And then we're going to move on to the fact that a Coffee Lake S CPU with iGPU has been spotted in the company's documentation. Then we're going to make a quick trip to NAND flash prices. And then for our final tech item, we're going to move on to the fact that we have a re early review of the Ryzen 5 2600. And then we're going to move on to our non-gaming item, which is going to be some comments from EA's Patrick Soderlund regarding Battlefront 2. So obviously for the clock speed, we've got Ryzen 5 coming in at 3.4 gigahertz and boosting up to 3.9. However, they did manage to overclock this to an impressive 4.9 megahertz or 4,000. Sorry, gigahertz, not megahertz, which is obviously 4,099 megahertz. And this was at a voltage of 1.45 and also with a X470 Gaming Pro Carbon motherboard. But what about the results, I hear you ask? Well, I'm going to kick things off with Cinebench. As we see the Ryzen 5 2600 on the X470 motherboard coming in just under the 8700K with a result of 1286. Of course, the 8700K is at 1425. So there's a significant difference there, but it is not too far behind. But obviously, it is fairly behind the Ryzen 7 2700X, excuse me. But that's not exactly shocking. But it is still a pretty impressive result, especially when you look at what was going on with the 1600. Now we're going to have a quick look at X264 and once again the 2600 is coming in around the middle here as we see a result of 41 coming in just under the 8700K it's 45 but beating the 8600K rather nicely and not terribly behind that of the 1700X either. Difference of 5 which you know is not exactly a small change but it's not like it's the other side of the chart from it like say for example the 6700k now before i move on to a couple of gaming benchmarks for this we do have 3d mark fire strike and it does come in at a fairly respectable fourth place here with the result of 16.133 coming in just under the 7800x and not too far behind that of the 2700x as well now obviously the most interesting part here is obviously how it's doing versus its predecessors and the 1700x did come in at 15.24 so you can see the fairly significant improvement there obviously this isn't going to be matching up to the 8700k but given that the 2700 2700x excuse me was just behind that it's not exactly surprising to see the 2600 not matching up to it but it still is a fairly decent result with a pretty nice improvement over the previous generation and still coming in fairly comfortably over the 8600k now before I close out this segment I just want to focus on a couple of gaming benchmarks as we do actually have a full suite of review here and of course I'm going to link their review in the description below this video but we do have first of all Doom and the 2600 here does really really well it has a result of 163 coming in just under the 8600k but actually coming above the 8700k and interestingly enough it actually comes above the 2700x as well so i do wonder if that result is going to be duplicated as of course we approach the official launch of these processes i am still trying to get my hands on one by the way for those of you who are asking but the point is i do wonder if we're going to see this reflected in other reviews as well not by any means saying that these are fudge numbers or anything like that but obviously there are a million billion variables when it comes to these sort of things. So I'm going to be interested to see if this is a common theme, just a one-off, or we'll have to wait and see. Or if the difference is less profound. Obviously, we are talking to literally two frames. But it is so interesting that it did reign above the 2700X. But I am curious to see if we see this trend follow across other reviews. Now, the final gaming benchmark that I want to focus on today in this particular video is going to be Rise of the Tomb Raider. And... While it's not exactly reigning supreme at the top of the chart or anything, I wouldn't exactly be mad at these results if I was the owner of this particular processor, as we do see a result of 110 frames per second, and that is only 3 frames under that of the 2700X, and we're talking 0.7 of a frame below the 8700K, which is not bad at all, considering Rise of the Tomb Raider is not exactly the most forgiving of games. Now, obviously, that is on DX11. On DX12, we do see a better result of 115 frames per second, which is slightly better than the result presented by the 8700K of 113. So, you know, make of that what you will, basically. A pretty nice review from Ultra Pieces once again, so do find their link in the description below this video. 
as there is a ton more there that they have tested, but that is a small sampling for you. As I said, however, we're going to kick things off with NVIDIA and Intel. Now, you may recall that NVIDIA was getting licensing money from Intel. Now, Intel stopped paying NVIDIA this money last year in March of 2017. And according to the report, which is from Fudzilla, and I'm not throwing shade or anything like that, but I'm just saying do take this pinch of salt because they haven't cited any sources. I always urge people to always have a little bit of skepticism when it comes to anything that's been unconfirmed. So do keep that in mind. But regardless of that, what they're basically saying is that the licensing deal was actually a settlement and basically Intel agreed to pay NVIDIA licensing fees, which basically amounted to $1.5 billion, which was paid in installments and basically in installments of $300 million. So this deal is now over, but Intel haven't announced any new license. And basically, this harkens back to the day of Enforce, which is... And basically what Intel did is they made some major changes on the DMI to their CPU, and they changed the way that the CPU buses work so that these particular chips just could not work on Enforce motherboards. Now Nvidia have a, had a license for a front side bus so Intel basically changed it to DMI and put a ton of the logic on the processor itself basically making it almost impossible to work on Enforce motherboards and you might ask why did they do this? Well allegedly it's because Jensen Huang hired people to make a Denver CPU and it was supposed to be a x86 solution and Intel basically were like nah Name and decided to do this whole thing with the Enforce motherboards. Now, Denver eventually became an ARM solution and basically still loves, lives on to this day inside Tegra, but allegedly this is to do with this particular quarrel between the two companies and what was actually called a licensing deal, again according to this report, was actually a settlement between the two companies because Intel basically just was trying to bully Nvidia because they did something that they didn't like essentially. Now again, this is all pure speculation, do keep in mind that this is not confirmed but it does tie into history and all the good stuff but you know, make of it what you will essentially. Let's move on to our next topic which of course is regarding Coffee Lake S and the iGPU. Now, essentially what has happened here has sharp-eyed individuals have noticed that Intel have started listing technical documents referring to Coffee Lake S parts. Now, these are confidential and all that sort of stuff, and there's not really any real information to be had, but we do have various documents available. So, as you can see on the screen, we have various documents with just names that just roll off the tongue. We have Coffee Lake S8 Plus 2 DDR4 UDIM Reference Validation Platform Technical Documentation Kit. We also have Coffee Lake S6 Plus 2, S8 Plus 2 Processor Lineup Ball Out Signal and Mechanical Package. And also Coffee Lake S8 Plus 2 Processor Power Integrity Model. Now what's interesting is that these are listed under the 8th generation library. So this does point to it, to it being a Coffee Lake S part. Now what's interesting, or actually I would say most interesting about this particular document or documents I suppose I should say, is that it does actually go against some previous rumours as of course the 8 is the cause and then the plus 2 is the iGPU part. So essentially this goes against the rumours that said that the 8 core CPU from Intel would actually be Ice Lake. Now of course there's speculation that this could be the 8086K that I discussed the other day but this does go, go, go against, excuse me, the core count of the previous leak that I discussed, which did show that the 8086K had six cores, but obviously there are multiple possibilities there. It could be that this is nothing to do with the 8086K. It could be that the previous leak was incorrect or a fake, or it could be neither of those things. So it is interesting, but it does kind of run counter to, as I said, the rumours that the 8-core would be Ice Lake. But when you're talking rumours upon rumours upon rumours, it's like, which one do you believe? And to be honest, the answer is, well, you kind of believe one more than the other based upon the amount of evidence. But you should always wait for official com uh, confirmation from the company. But it is intriguing, nonetheless, to see this listed. And it could, of course, it could be that we're going to be getting this and Ice Lake as well. But, of course, we'll have to wait and see. 
So let's move on to NAND flash prices. Now, of course, over the last few months, it has been one of the worst times to upgrade that I've personally seen. Of course, we've seen price increases on you know, memory. You know, RAM is often prone to supply and is issues and price increase due to that. But obviously, we've had that and the whole issue with graphics card prices going through the roof due to the demand due to cryptocurrency mining. So it has been pretty awful, to be honest. And I had someone ask me, yeah, yeah, can you help me like build my PC and stuff? And I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but we shouldn't do it right now. Like, if you can wait, then wait, please. But it is finally getting better. And we have seen NAND prices finally start to come down a bit as well. And this is actually because of a slight NAND oversupply towards the markets. Now, this is even including some stuff that has happened which impacted global NAND production by 3.5% just last month. But despite that, we have seen oversupply of NAND, which obviously has helped reduce prices. So this is in combination with the fact that people have been investing like crazy in NAND factories, as obviously there is a huge market and it's only ever increasing with smartphone demand and of course overall increase in storage space and speed demands and obviously we've got AI and processing workloads that sort of thing so basically more and more money is being pumped into this which obviously means more and more NAND is being produced so we are basically seeing the decline in NAND flash prices continuing amidst oversupply so now it's not a bad time to invest if perhaps you're thinking of getting an SSD but obviously these things can change on a whim, so if you have been waiting for them to decrease, I'm not saying go, 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 get it now, panic, 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 or, panic, panic, panic or anything, but uh, just do keep in mind that, of course, supply might tighten as we go towards the second half of 2018, or we could see things continue to decline. We just don't know what's going to happen. That's basically what I'm trying to say. So let's finish up with our final item for today, which is, as I said, regarding EA's Patrick Soderlund. Now I'm just going to skip over the backstory, I think most of you have heard all about this more times than you'd care to admit, but there was a recent interview with The Verge and Patrick Sodeland, and of course there's going to be a link in the description below this video to the interview with The Verge, but basically Patrick has been speaking regarding the recent controversy over the use of microtransactions and loot boxes in Star Wars Battlefront 2. And he said, quote, I'd be lying to you if I said that's what happened with Battlefront and what's happened with everything surrounding loot boxes and these things haven't had an effect on EA as a company and an effect on us as management. We have taken significant steps as a company to review and understand the mechanics around monetization, loot boxes and other things in our games before they go to market. For the games that come next, for Battlefield or for Anthem, players have made it very clear that we can't afford to make similar mistakes and we won't. And then he made what I would call a very intriguing comment that perhaps means that EA are more self-aware than perhaps they were appearing to us because he said, quote, it's clear to us that players see the company differently than we do. And in that situation, as a member of the executive team, as a guy who runs all of the studios, I have to take that seriously. So perhaps they realise that they're seeing as pretty much pure evil in the gaming industry. I mean, obviously I'm being a bit facetious, but... I do wonder, like, you, you knew, EA, like, you, you, you knew, come on. <laughs> now, I've also said before that they can't say, oh, yeah, this took us by surprise, we didn't expect it. Well, no, what they didn't expect was how bad a reaction they got. They probably planned for some backlash. They probably thought, oh, yeah, this is definitely going to get some negativity, but overall, I think the... Uh, the reception to this is going to be positive. We're still going to make, you know, piles and piles of cash to a screw from a duck level. Great. That's probably what they thought. Obviously, I wasn't there. I don't know. But um, they were taken by surprise by the, by the ferocity of the backlash to it. And good. Because people clearly show them, no, this is too far. This is way too far. Like, dial it back. Dial it back, please. And I'm glad that people made it very, very clear that what EA tried to pull is not okay. Because it's not okay. Like, you guys are very, very aware, if you've watched this channel at all, really, that I have a distaste for microtransactions in full price games. They can be done well. If they're, if they're purely cosmetic, great. Have at it. I mean, I don't like it because it's a $60 game, but if it's cosmetic, then who cares? But... Obviously, that's not what happened in Battlefront 2. We basically did see a mobile game with a $60 price tag, but obviously not a mobile game with the 
mechanics of the loot boxes and microtransactions and how they actually worked and blah 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 blah. You've, you've had all this point before. I'm not going to talk too much more on this, but basically, EA pushed way too far and they thought they could get away with it and they didn't. Now I'm glad that they've learned from it and they've clearly learned that you know this is the line here. We cannot cross this line again because. They were definitely burned by this, and they definitely had a stern talking to at least from Disney because they were probably not best pleased with the bad negativity surrounding that game given that, you know, the Last Jedi was about to come out and they were like, look, look we don't need this right now, can you just cease for the moment please? So I'm glad that they're not going to be pulling this again, but they're definitely going to be seeing how far they can push things because, well, it's EA, but... You know, if we don't see something like this, you know, infecting Anthem, great. Who knows what Anthem could have been like if we hadn't said no as harshly as we did to Battlefront 2. We probably would have seen a similar system in that because, well, it's clearly got a multiplayer focus from what we've seen. So I wouldn't be surprised to know that in an alternate universe where everyone was like, yeah, this is fine to Battlefront 2, that we would have seen a similar system in Anthem. I wouldn't have been surprised to see that at all, to be honest with you. But I'm glad that that won't be the case. But of course, we shouldn't celebrate too hard until we see what Anthem actually brings to the table. Anyway, as I said, the full interview with them is going to be linked in the description below this video, video rather. but thank you very much for watching. Your support is always appreciated. Do remember to give us a like and subscribe. It does help out a great deal, and I'll see you next time.